So thank you and thanks for inviting me, Harvey and John and Bob. So I'm going to talk about some work that has been partially done with Adam Koborinski here. Uh, he's a PhD student in philosophy at, at Western. Um, that was before I left Western, I just started in Vienna now. But, um, yeah, so, so we basically looked at information theoretic reconstructions and thought about what, what we can actually learn from them. And um, I am basically working today by example of a, a reconstruction where I was involved, but maybe some of the lessons also apply to further reconstructions. So here's, a, here's an outline of the talk. Um, I have to apologize to those of you who have seen this like a dozen times before, but I will go through the convex framework in, in the beginning, like what is a probabilistic theory, um, what kind of landscape of theories do we have. Um, so, so this Lots of you will know all that, but I need this in what follows to make some points a bit clearer. Um, then I will talk a reconstruction of quantum theory with um, Luis Marsalis and some other people that some of you have heard before as well. But I will try to make some new points. For example, I will refer to Chris Fuchs' idea that maybe we can learn something about quantum reality by looking at reconstructions. And um, there, there's like a, a little proposal that we have to make what that could be. Uh, the third part. We'll, be, we'll talk about interpretations as well. Um, so, so what we do here is we argue that in a way um, these reconstructions tell us that we can understand if we want quantum theory some kind of principle theory and that this is in a way a partial interpretation of quantum theory. <coughs> I will also argue that it gives a kind of challenge to psionic interpretations of the quantum state. Now I am not very feeling very strongly about this, so this is really just a proposal. Um, I'm pretty much agnostic about interpretations. So, yeah, so I'll take this maybe with a grain of salt. And I also think that maybe this question of interpretation is not the most important one here in this context. But there are other questions where you can learn something about from the reconstructions that I actually think might be more, more important in the long run. And this will be what I call your more essential consequences. And these are questions like what are one theory's closest cousins in a way? Like what are the theories that are different from one theory but closest to it in some sense? How can we do new experiments to test quantum theory against alternatives? And what can we learn about the relation between quantum theory and probability in space time? So I think we can learn a bit um, from the, the reconstructions for that kind of these kinds of questions. Okay. Now let's look at probabilistic theories. Again, probably some of you will be bored, but let's, let's nevertheless go through it. So the idea is to take a quite pragmatic view on the quantum state and see. When you ask what is a quantum state, then I would say that all interpretations of quantum theory agree to that extent that they say, well, whatever it is, it is at least that thing that allows us to determine for all possible questions that we may decide a physical system to ask, probabilities of finding possible answers. And that's how we use it in the lab. So, for example, we might ask nature the question, is the spin up in that direction, yes or no? And then we send uh, electron and silver atom from a stand Gallup device and we get one of two outcomes and the quantum state allows us to compute the probability of yes or no and that's what the state does for us. Now if we have quantum states then what is a Hilbert space or what is a space density matrices? Well it's just a collection of all possible states that we could have. So a collection of all states that a system could possibly be in and it's also close undertaking mixture, so you can toss a coin and prepare a state at random, and this will still be a valid state. So, uh, close undertaking mixtures means you know, we toss some, some dice, and then if it's even, we prepare psi, if it's odd, we prepare phi. And the statistical behavior of this will be described by another valid state, which is in this case given by the one half, one half mixture of the corresponding density matrices. Now, what do probabilistic theories do? Well, they just generalize that. And that's basically the main point. So instead of asking what is a quantum state, you can just say more generally, what do we understand as a state in that framework? And the state will just be the thing that allows us to determine the probabilities of finding answers to questions that we ask the physical system by measurement. And instead of asking what is a Hilbert space, if we go beyond quantum theory, we may not have Hilbert spaces anymore, we can ask what is in a state space, and the state space will just be a collection of states all the states that the system could possibly be in, um, whatever it means, and there will be closed undertaking mixtures. In the sense that we still want to be able to do this, 
that prepare state you end up with some probability. Okay. Now if you look at this mathematically, and we'll say more about the formalization of this in a few slides, then this gives us a landscape of theories. So there's like a huge landscape of possible theories of probability, um, theories or collections of state spaces that fit into this description. And one of them is quantum theory. Another one would be classical probability theory with a state such as probability distributions. Um, you could have more general things, like C star algebra is obviously in there, but also things like box worlds, and then we'll talk about that. Um, but the goal now is of reconstructions is to find a set of physical or information theoretic or whatever simple principles you might have that pick out quantum theory from this landscape of possibilities. Um, so that's what you want to do. And to see how that goes, we need a little more details in the formalism. Now what I will do in the next slides is I will, prepend, prepend, I will uh, you know, explain things in terms of boxes, preparations and measurements. That's very instrumentalist. But you don't have to interpret in that way. That's just one possible way to do it. And, and here's how to describe such a theory. So essentially state spaces and, and probabilistic theories are just arbitrary convex sets, basically. So think of a convex set like that. And they live in some vector space with real numbers. So why do you get this? Well, it's, it's quite easy if you have in mind situations like the following. Suppose you think that in physics there are situations where you can meaningfully speak about a three-stage process, something like a preparation and a transformation and a measurement. Yeah, it could be boxes in your laboratory, but it doesn't have to be in your lab. And a simple example would be a classical coin toss, where you say, well, if I have my box here and I push the button, then a coin will be spit out, maybe it'll see the coin if it's heads or tails, and there's some probability of heads or tails. And then something's happening to the coin that I want as a transformation device. For example, maybe it rotates it, puts it on its head, and then there's a measurement. And the measurement could just look at its head or the tails and then flash a light depending on the outcome. And in this sense, you could say, well, the state that's coming out here, the thing that allows me to describe the probabilities of measurement outcomes, is just a probability distribution. Probability of heads, probability of tails, so it's, it's a vector P in one way. And a state space, if you ask what could this be, it's really just something like that. It looks like a line segment, and here's like definitely heads state, here's a definitely tail state, here's the fair coin, and so on. Transformation could be a map that you know, takes heads to tails and vice versa, so that would be a linear map of that form. And so what you see is that you get a state in, you get a state out, and it's also linear. And also, the measurement is described in a linear way. So you compute the probability, for example, of this light flashing, just by taking the state, omega, and basically taking the inner product with, a, with an effect. So that, that's what people call an effect. So it's just some object that from the state computes a probability between 0 and 1. This is the probability of heads here, for example, which is p. Now, the same. The same kind of description applies to a quantum spin one half particle, so it's a entirely degree of freedom. We say, well, now if there's such a thing, then what the preparation device will actually output will now be um, a superposition, for example, of spin up and down. Uh, it doesn't have to be a pure state, it could be a mixed state, so you have a 2 by 2 density matrix, and the 2 by 2 density matrix is represented by the block ball, as, as you all know, I guess. So you have two angles that parameterize your pure state, and if you have density matrix, it's on them as well. Um, what could be the transformations? For example, unitaries. And if you look at what they do to the state in this block ball picture, they basically rotate this block ball. And then what could be an outcome here of a measurement? For example, you could measure the spin in some direction d, and then you get the probability from quad rule, which is again a linear expression, and it gives you the outcome. Green, green light flash again. So you can see, see the pattern here. Um, we say, well, if I have that situation, I might want to describe the set of all possible states, just yeah, as some state space, whatever that is. I don't assume anything about it, except for the one thing I mentioned before, you want to be able to prepare mixtures. So you say, well, maybe when I push a button, maybe randomly I prepare either omega 1 or omega 2. So this should be about the state. And this basically tells you that 
your state space must must be convex sets. So one half omega one plus one half omega two is somewhere in the middle here. So your state space it should be convex, and that's basically it. So in quantum theory, your state space would be, for example, for an n-level system, would be the n-level n density matrices in classical probability theory. You would have the n outcome probability distributions. And um, so if you picture them, you, you can have all kinds of beasts, like a zoo of state spaces. So that's, here's a classical bit that we've seen. Here's a quantum bit. Um, now a classical three-level system would be something like a triangle, because you have the first, the second, and the third outcome, and all their mixtures. So you get a simplex in the classical case. Now a quantum three-level system is quite funny. I'm not sure if many of you have seen this picture. So if you look at the three by three density matrices, it's not a ball, but it's some kind of weird shaped convex set that has like flat pieces and boundary and that's a picture by Tsikovsky and Weiss, I think, really trying to picture what, what that state space would look like. But you could have anything in principle in that framework of temporal theories. Here's for example something that people study in quantum information theory and state space is square. It's called G bit something. Okay, so we have this, this landscape of theories and then the state spaces that somehow live in there. One theory is that kind of state spaces and so on. And now you can ask, well, how would physics be different if one of these other theories apply? Well, what would it mean if we didn't have quantum theory? And maybe not classical, but something, something else. And then obviously, and again, I'm probably the only few of you for whom this is new, but here's one situation where you can get new behavior, and this is in a, in a Bell experiment. So in a, in an abstract way to depict a Bell experiment would be to say, you have two parties, A and B, Alice and Bob, that are space-like separated, Alice can, they share something which could be an entangled state, and they do an experiment in the sense that A decides on some input, which could be, for example, zero, it could mean she decides to measure spin in x direction, one could mean that she measures spin in y direction, and then she gets an outcome, minus one or plus one, and the same for Bob. And in quantum physics, we know that these probabilities are just calculated by the Born rule from two projection operators. In classical physics, you would have something like that, a hidden variable, lambda, that would be shared randomness that's distributed to A and B. So it's a different kind of formula to compute these probabilities. And, but in both cases, you can see, well, there's an important property that's satisfied here, namely no signaling. So if you just look at Alice, locally at her laboratory, and then it turns out that what she sees, the statistic that she observes, is independent of Bob's input. So this is very important, obviously, because if you think that they're really far away from each other, um, and if Bob's input had any effect on Alice, what Alice sees, then they could use it as a bell telephone and send signals faster than light. But this is impossible, thus by the end of lots of theory entanglement that help with that. Um, now there's a difference, obviously, as you all know, between classical and quantum correlations, and one of them would be a violation of a bell inequality. So here's what's called the CHSH bell inequality. You compute these correlators, you multiply the outcomes together, classically it's less than two, and you've all seen that that quantumly you can actually violate the inequality and get up to two square root of two. Now, for Pesco and Rolich in, in the 90s, they asked, hmm. It's quite interesting that you can do more than classically, but you still cannot send signals. So that may be, well, there is one theory. Is that somehow the principle how we can understand this behavior? So what they ask basically is, are quantum correlations the most general correlations, which violate the inequalities, but still don't allow you to signal? And then the answer was no. And I find still, still find that somewhat surprising. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, you can write out correlations which are still non-signaling, so you couldn't use them to, to do a telephone, but they're not possible if you want to do it. And here's an example in the PR box correlations. So um, what are correlations? They're just tables of probabilities that tell you what if, if the measurement that, say, Alice does measurement number one, Bob does measurement number one, what's the probability of the outcome? So you say, well, in this case, the outcomes will be anti-correlated, plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. And in all three other cases, they will be perfectly correlated. And you can check that this is, satisfies the no signaling principle, but if you compute the value of this, this bell correlation, you get a value of four. 
and this is more than you can get in quantum theory. So this obviously is something you cannot realize in quantum theory in that setup. And here's a picture that people like to draw. And this is a set of all non-signaling correlations, a sketch of it. It's a polytope. And some subset is classically realizable, which would be some sub-polytope, maybe the green one. And then there's a larger set, namely the quantum set, that you can do within quantum physics in your laboratory. But the whole non-signaling set um, is actually still bigger. And you can, when you see where, how does it fit into this landscape of theories, then this is just some kind of state space in that landscape. So this non-signaling polytope appears somewhere in that landscape, in a theory called box world. There's a possible state space that describes two properties. Okay, um, now, now here's something um, that maybe that some people ask me, and I asked myself as well, particularly after yesterday. So here's a question, this is somewhat boring. <laughs> yeah? I'm really considering only very simple setups, like preparation, transformation, measurement, and that's it. So why, why, don't, why don't we do proper category theory in these reconstructions yeah, and look at more interesting things? And here's, here's an answer. So I think we should do category theory, but a bit later. So first, what I want to do is just look at simple situations first. Let's just see what these simple setups give us. Um, also, I think if I have simple setups where I don't have to talk about composition, then it's much easier to really write down modifications of quantum theory. I don't have to construct them for, for a whole like, network of things that can happen. And we also would like to make as few assumptions as possible. Um, but if you say, oh, I can, I can have these boxes and things moving around um, among these boxes, I think there's sometimes assumptions that we make that may just not, not hold in the end. Um, but I think well, category theory will put will any on later on. Here's an example. So Howard Barnum and, and co-authors, they looked at what they call Euclidean Jordan algebras, something like quasi on quantum mechanics. And they asked, how can I combine them into like circuits and composite state spaces? And you can rub that out. And it works pretty well, but it's quite complicated to work that out. So what you want to do first is discover that, that there is quaternionic quantum mechanics, and then later on you want to categorize the theory and see how they fit together into something bigger. That's at least the strategy that we adopted here. And for example, what this tells us that we've been really very careful in, in, in our axiomatics. For example, we didn't assume that if I have the same system twice, that I can necessarily swap it. So that's why, why I don't want to start with category theory at this point. Okay, now what kind of other physics could we see instead of just different kinds of non-locality? Um, well, one example is, is higher order interference. And um, let me just ask you quickly, like, who of you know this already? What this is? Most of you, yeah. Um, okay, so let me just briefly nevertheless explain this because I'll come back to it later. It goes back to Sorkin in the 90s. And um, it goes back to just looking at first the double slit experiment and asking what does interference mean here if I just talk about probabilities of clicks. So suppose you have two slits and a particle, and then a detector in which you click if the particle pinches the screen in some region. Now what you can do is you can say what's that probability if all these two slits, if both of these slits are open, what probability do I get? Or you say well, let's put a blockade here, let's block the slit number two, and say, what's now the probability of getting a click? Let's call that just P1. Now you block the other slit, slit two is open, what's the probability now? It's called P2. And P1, two would be if, what if both of these slits are open. And now we find this in quantum theory that the probabilities do not add up. So like both slits open will not make probabilities add up, which you would expect in a similar setup described by classical probability theory. And that's what you would call interference in the simplest case. Now what is third order or higher order interference? Well, it's basically going to more than two slits. So here's a third slit. And you can play the same game now. You can look at the probabilities of clicks, depending on whether you block one of the slits or two of the slits, or if all of them are open. And what you find is that in quantum theory, and also classically, you find the situation here which tells you that if all the three slits are open and you look at the probability, you can decompose it into contributions of pairs of slits and subtract the single slit contributions. Now, 
This is true classically and quantumly, but you can imagine that it's violated. And if it's violated, you would call it third order interference. That's what Sorkin would call it. And so what you see is that there is no third order interference in quantum theory, and that's a prediction. And you can go to the lab and test it, try to do it at least, under some assumptions. And here's one of the experiments where people did it. Uh, really optically, it's quite funny, you really have blocking mass here, where you can have slits open or closed. And what you find is that this term that's supposed to be zero, this third order interference term, is found to be quite small. Less than 10 to the minus 2, or it could be like, I think they're down to 10 to the minus 3 now, or something like this. So, so but this um, is a way in which physics could be different. And some of these convex theories actually give you non zero values here. So that's just an example. Okay, right, so that's, that's this landscape of probabilistic theories. Um, now, what about reconstructing quantum theory? How can we pick out quantum theory from it? And I will give you like, one possible reconstruction. So that's, that was our goal. Pick out quantum theory from this landscape of theories. And I will now describe one particular set of principles. And if you write down these principles, they will give you quantum theory exactly. And it's worked with Louis Massanis, Shinigo Tavuzia, David Pellet-Garcia. Um, but let me stress that there are many other reconstructions that other people have done, particularly Lucien, who has started the modern version of this program, more or less, that have been Clifford Google Halverson and, and many other developments. Okay, so, so how do we do it in this case? Um, let me give you four postulates or four principles, and that will be the common theory. Um, so, so the first postulate, and that will be important later, I will come back to that. So that's called continuous reversibility. And it says continuous reversible time evolution can in principle map every pure state to every other. So if you have one system that is spin one half particle, so you have spin points in some direction, that's one pure state, spin point in another direction is another state, then you can just continuously move over the spin uh, by some, some unitary transformation of the Hamiltonian and map one state to the other. So that is possible in principle. And here we say that should always be the case, which is our first postulate. Good. Second postulate is uh, tomographic locality. And it says that, well, it involves, again, two parties, Alice and Bob, and they share some state. I've drawn one two state here, but it could be a state of your theory, whatever that is. And the principle says that the states of a composite system, like A, B here, is completely characterized by the correlations of measurements on the individual components. So what you do is you tell Alice and Bob, hey, Alice and Bob, um, I've given you the state now, many copies of it. Please go to the lab and tell me what state that is. And then they say, yeah, no problem. They go to the lab and they make local measurements. They don't have to meet in the middle or build a very big machine around both laboratories. They just do local measurements and from that they can reconstruct the density matrix. That's and here it's meant as a principle, it should be possible in general. It's also true classically, for example. You can um, get classical correlations from local statistics. The third postulate is existence of an information unit. Um, so it says that there is a type of system, some kind of bit, or U bit for universal bit, such that the state of any system can be encoded into a sufficiently large number of such bits. So here's, here's a bunch of bits, and here's some other physical system. And now you can have a process, which is like an encoding operation, that encodes the state of your physical system into the bits. And maybe it erases the state of the physical system, or maybe not, you don't really care. And you can also go backwards and retrieve the state again. And now classically that's, that's true, you can do it. This can just be classical bits. One in theory, this could be qubits on a quantum computer. And here we say it should be true in general. What we also want is that these bits can, in principle, talk to each other, so they are not evolving independently. Then there should be some continuous reversible interaction possible between them. You can also see that maybe as postulate one, which is applied to these bits. Okay, last postulate is called no simultaneous encoding. Basically, it says that the the bit is is a bit in the way you expect. So this universal bit that I talked about. If that's used to perfectly encode one classical bit, like 0 or 1, 
then you cannot simultaneously encode any further information into it. So once you have one bit encoded into it, you are and Seidling has suggested something like that as a principle for, for qubits at some point. Can I ask you a question? By continuous, yes. you imply that the state space has got some logical structure. Yeah, so, so the thing is, um, I'm working in finite dimensions here, and I should have said that from the start. Everything's finite dimensional. And once you have a vector space in finite dimensions, you have a topological structure. Yeah. And continuity here means that you have a transformation, and the transformation is continuously connected to the identity transformation. So, like in time evolution, you say, spin points in that direction, you switch on your Hamiltonian, and then it moves over. And then for very small times, you have something close to the identity. So this gives you something like a Lie group of transformations. That's what continuity here means, so that it's connected to the identity, and you can have move over the state continuously. And is it important to you that these postulates can be independently motivated or, or not? not so like that. Uh, what do you mean by independently motivated? Well, maybe you're interested in reconstructing quantum theory because you like quantum theory, or maybe you're interested in mm -hmm. non quantum theories. Are you yeah. interested in going beyond quantum theory? Then yes. you want to say, I've got some independent reason to believe in these postulates. Yes. But if you're just interested in reconstructing quantum theory, it might be enough for you to say, this is a property of quantum theory. Yeah. No, um, two things. First, yes, I'm interested in getting modifications of quantum theory. Yeah. I will come back to that later. Second, I'm also interested in pointing out the difference to the classical case, and this will also be useful for that. I will come back to it. I will come to that in a few slides. Okay. Making sure that these four principles of postulates hold within the framework of probabilistic theories, and if n of these universal bits, then the state space of this n universal bits is exactly standard complex quantum theory. Uh, the n by n, 2 to the n by 2 to the n density matrices. The transformations are the unitaries, um, the reversible transformations at least, the unitaries, and the measurements are described by the standard trace rule with uh, projection or positive operatory measure. So these give you exactly the state space of quantum theory. And, and here's a sketch of the proof, and I find it quite, quite funny to see how it goes. So you start by saying, well, this theory has a bit, a two-level system. It's just some convex state space. I don't know which one. Maybe it's this funny shaped thing of whatever dimension. I don't know what it is. And then you can say, well, if I have no simultaneous encoding and I can only encode one bit into it, then it's, you can show that it cannot have any flat pieces on the boundary because you use these flat pieces to encode extra information. Like one bit is are you here or there, and the other bit is where on the flat piece are you. So you have to have a droplet-like shape. And if you continue with reversibility, and you move, time evolution moves you around, gives you lots of symmetry, and forces you into something like an ellipsoid. And then you can just redefine this, like reparameterize your state, and you get a ball of some unknown dimension, which is the Bloch ball. Well, you don't know yet, but it's a three dimensional ball, so you have to, nevertheless, you do get that it is three dimensional by, by invoking continuous reversibility and the, and the fact that they can actually attack. So let me say a bit more about that. Why is, why is the block ball three-dimensional? So, so this is like another, actually an extra paper because it's not so easy to prove. Um, but what you can do is the following. You can say, well, what if I have two of these bits? Not one, but not two of them. And they are all d-dimensional ball state spaces. And I want that they somehow interact with each other. And you can show that if the dimension of the ball is not three, then the only way you can have continuous reversible time evolution on them it's just locally, product transformation. Something on A times something on B. They cannot interact. They can only interact if the dimension is three. And you can come up with some group theoretical reason from it that you look out from the proof. It has to do with the rotation group and so on. But yeah, that's why dimension three is singled out. It's the only way to have these bits interact with each other. OK, so, so this is like a way to phrase it as a theorem. Maybe I don't go through it in uh, much detail. Um, so, so at this point, I've shown you one way, one way to, to derive the Hilbert space formulas with quantum theory. Now, what, is, what does that tell us, or what does it not tell us? Really? So, um, there's a paper by Chris Fuchs, 2002, um, where he said basically that it would be good 
if we could derive quantum theory from axioms. Um, because we want to understand all these peculiar features of the formalism in, say, information theoretic terms. Um, what you hoped is that we cannot understand all of quantum mechanics information theoretically, but that something remains. So he writes here that this still that, that remains when we have found an axiomatization or reconstruction. The piece of quantum theory with no information theoretic significance will be our first unadorned glimpse of quantum reality. So the idea is quantum theory is all about maybe knowledge or information or belief, but not just that. And, what, and whatever remains must be something um, that, we, that we learn about the actual quantum world out there. What about this reconstruction? Um, I'm pretty sure, well, I know actually, that um, none of these postulates are the consequence of that. Well, we'll make Chris satisfied, but well, he doesn't really think we can really learn something about quantum reality. But maybe we can. So here's, here's a different viewpoint. So if you look at these postulates, um, are they information theoretic? Well, in a way, they are all somewhat information theoretic. Yeah. This P4 talks about encoding, it's an information unit, um, tomographic locality. But I would argue that the first postulate is some, to some extent less information theoretic. So continuous reversibility, continuous reversibility, maybe the non-information theoretic distillate that, that remains and that's characteristic of quantum theory. Um, and actually you can see that the other postulates, P2, P3, and P4, they are all true classically for discrete classical systems. But P1 is not, and we will see now why. If you have finite dimensional discrete systems, then you cannot have continuous reversible time evolution classically. For example, you can have a classical bit and you say, well, maybe my ball, like a ball that's either on the left or on the right, but I don't know where it is, so I have a probability distribution. And um, the pure states of the classical theory would just be the ones where you know where the ball is. Either it's definitely on the left, probability is 1, 0, or definitely on the right, probability is 0, 1. Now you, can, you can, of course, swap these two states. Yeah? Just take the ball and move it to the other side. So you swap it and you get the other pure state. But that's a discrete transformation. It's not continuous. You don't continuously move it over. So what you can do continuously classically in a discrete system is only add noise very slowly. And let the probability, for example, go to one half, one half slowly. But you cannot continuously move over definite left to definite right. But obviously you can do it quantumly. If R and L is two perfectly distinguishable states, you can engineer an Hamiltonian so that at some point in time, you get the R state from the L state exactly. And um, you can also see that in the shape of the state space. So the classical ones are somewhat discrete. They have corners. You can only ever do discrete transformations. They have to be reversible. But the quantum ones, they have infinitely many pure states, and they have, they have kind of round. And if you only knew classical theory, you would probably find that very surprising, that you can have a discrete system where you can continuously move one possibility together. So in a way, maybe this is some kind of glimpse of quantum reality, or at least some characteristic property that turns out in this framework to distinguish quantum theory from classical theory. And that's, yeah, that's kind of the opposite of what you usually hear. I uh, usually hear, well, um, you know, what quantum theory does is it quantizes things. We have classically continuous things, quantum theory makes them discrete. Here's just the other way around. Now, good, now this will be the part that Adam Koborinsky and I have thought about, and um, we, as I said, um, he, he's a philosophy student, and what we did was think a bit about what could that tell us about interpretations. Again, I'm pretty much agnostic about that part, but I think there are some things to be said, um, relying on this and other reconstructions. So, um, here's something that we argue for. Um, kind of a thesis, maybe. Um, and what we think we can say is the following. I think that information theoretic reconstructions, they give some kind of partial interpretation of quantum mechanics. They tell you that it's, in a way, a principal theory of information, whatever information means in detail. It doesn't tell you everything, and it leaves you many alternatives, several alternatives, how you can extend this to a full interpretation of quantum theory. Um, and even though it's not a full interpretation, I think it presents a challenge for what people call sometimes psionic interpretations of the quantum state. 
kind of the same algorithm. It also kind of highlights the deficiency of this interpretation in terms of the explanatory power. So what do I mean by that? First of all, let me say this is none of this is really new. And you can say much in much more detail what I would say. For example, there's Jeffrey Book, who has said this for a long time. He said, you can understand quantum theory as principle theory. And there's also Laura Feline and others who talk about the explanation in this context, and I will not go into those details. And we're not the first ones to say that. But, but here's what we, what we think you can say. So it's a partial interpretation of quantum mechanics as a principle theory. What do you mean by that? Um, well, other Einstein, and I've, I've learned now I should actually cite another paper by, by Einstein instead of this one. Um, but this distinction goes back to Einstein. He made a distinction between principle theories and constructive theories. Um, so he said we can distinguish various kinds of theories in physics. Most of them are constructive. They attempt to build up a picture of more complex phenomena out of the material of simple formal scheme from which they start out. Like the kinetic theory of gases. You have microscopic constituents that make up the theory and the phenomena that you see within the theory. And then he says, along with this, there exists a second class of theories, which are called principal theories. Um, the elements which form their basis are not hypothetically constructed, but empirically discovered ones. General characteristics of natural processes, principles that give rise to mathematically formulated criteria. So, um, and I think this reconstruction and others can then be understood in that sense as a principle theory. Now here are four principles that tell you that if we as they are satisfied, um, our world must work according to the principles of the Hilbert space formulas and quantum theory. So in a way this is a principle theory now. Um, because it identifies a small set of information theoretically, all computational principles trans our world. It's definitely not a constructive theory. We are not saying what's really going on in the world. So in what sense is it a partial interpretation? <coughs> well, I would say that um, what we find here is that the formalism of quantum theory and the core formalism without the choice of Hamiltonian, just the fact that we have Hilbert spaces and so on, is just found to give you any consequence easy to understand the constraints. So the complex numbers and the operators and everything, you don't have to postulate this when you, you derive it from, from simple principle. So, and, and I would say that um, this doesn't prove anything for sure, and doesn't tell you what, how you should interpret the state, but I think it's in some sense very suggestive. It's suggestive of the interpretation that quantum states are in some sense the same kind of stuff as probability distributions are. Um, and one way to say it here is to say, well, if I modify the principles a little bit, I take the first one, so that was continuous reversibility, and replace it by discrete reversibility, I do get classical probability theory. So it states the country's classical probability distribution. Um, good. So in that sense, we think we can say that first sentence. Now this leaves several alternatives for extending to a, to a full-fledged interpretation. So if you take this seriously, you can, you can start to go from, from there to some place. And um, what can you do? Well, first of all, these reconstructions do not tell you what quantum states really are. Um, and they also don't tell you what's really going on in the world. Like, what is this box where you do the measurement? So how do you obtain a full interpretation? Well, you have three possibilities if this is not exhaustive. You might do something else as well. But here's something you could do. You could adopt a subjective view of the quantum state, like cubism that you heard about, for example, or some kind of participatory realist interpretation of quantum theory. And there are many variants of it, like Brookman and Seidinger, there are variants of Copenhagen interpretation, cubism, and so on. Um, which, well, the idea is here that quantum states are really not things in the world, so that, that they really are about our knowledge or information or belief about the world or about things in the world or about future experiences that are caused by things in the world, for example. So that could be the case. And then, if you take the point of view, you can see this as an interpretation. You also say, well, I don't think that's the case. You should do more. Um, you could try to come up with a constructive successor of quantum theory somehow. Where you say, well, I want to understand what happens in a measurement. How come we see these bell correlations? 
So you would have something which is priced in Ushima for the world, which is currently not empirically accessible, but which gives rise to this information theoretic principles after some approximation of course brain. So an example, historical example, is the kinetic theory of gases, um, which is a constructive success of thermodynamics. First we have thermodynamic principles, but then later on we understand where they come from. And what you can see also in this example is that this constructive theory was actually the development was guided and somehow constrained by having the principle theory first. So that could be good news. It could mean that if we have principles that give us quantum theory, maybe that helps us to actually find such a success or if we think there should be one. A third option um, would be to say, well, um, I don't think there's this level of an underlying successor theory. We could just talk, try to combine one information theory with something like ontic structural realism. So what that we go on to structural realism um, in 10 seconds. So uh, you, you kind of say, well, I don't really need an entity-based constructive account of fundamental physics. Like stuff that moves around and collides, I just give that up. But you would have like an ontology of structures, of structural relations in some way. And these structures might be expressed or manifesting themselves in these information theory. Actually, uh, Lucas done that. So one of these people is now like, working on that and trying to see if that can really give you a consistent interpretation. So that's that's something you can do. You can try to do. Now, but what we really also think is that there is, yeah, even though you have all these options and stuff, really clear what it means in detail. These reconstructions are a challenge for for scientific interpretations. So is that. So what's a psionic interpretation? In a, in a nutshell, it's, it's an interpretation where you say, well, the quantum state is somehow an intrinsic property of your physical system. Yeah, in, in whatever sense you mean that in detail. But think of the quantum wave function as something like the electromagnetic field, something that's really out there. And you can, if you're careful, you know, put Bohmian mechanics somewhere in that can, many worlds and collapse theories. And then we argue by example of many worlds. Not that I particularly dislike many worlds, on the contrary, I think it's a nice interpretation, but just to make my point. Um, here's, here's a challenge for people who take many worlds interpretation seriously. What we should do is the following set up a framework of theories of many worlds, which is broad enough to give you some phenomena which are not predicted by quantum physics. And once you have that, then write down a simple set of principles that pick out Hilbert space quantum theory from this landscape. Because that's what you can do if you start with probability theories. We've just done that, and other people have done that too. But it's not so clear that you can do that if you start from a general many worlds perspective without assuming Hilbert space quantum theory from the start. And um, as long as this is not this challenge is not met, I would take a message from all of that, which I think Chaslav Bruckner phrased very, very clearly a couple of years ago, he uh, said the very idea of quantum states as representatives of information has the power to explain why the theory has the very mathematical structure it does. This in itself is the message of the reconstruction. So and I think this is, this is a quite interesting message to take. It doesn't commit you finally to any kind of interpretation, but it would still be nice to it's something that's in a way can we can only do so far by starting from from fierce probability. Okay. Good. Um, now I said that this is more of a, of a side um, thing, so I find it interesting. I don't think it's the most essential question we should ask, the most important one, or the, the most essential insight that we can take from reconstructions. So let's let's talk about other consequences. And, and things that we might want to do with it. So, one idea is to, to construct reasonable alternatives to quantum theory. Say, so here's quantum theory, it's a really nice theory, and here's another theory which is pretty good as well, would fit into physics as we know it, and then we can do an experimental test between the two. And for example, you might recall what I told you about this higher order interference, where people really go into the lab and see what happens on a, on a triple split. And quantum theory predicts you know, that this third order interference term is actually exactly zero. And so what you do in the lab is you say, is it zero or is it not zero? But of course, as a physicist, it would be
be better if you'd say, well, I have bottom theory, it predicts zero, and there's this other theory that predicts 10 to the minus 5. So that's what I want to rule out now. So it would be better to have a concrete a major alternative theory which predicts some concrete non zero value. You can make this point for other physical situations too. And one strategy you might want to adopt here is to say, well, let's just start with postulates that are known to give you quantum theory, and then let's drop some of them or relax them and see what other theories you get. And that would be very interesting for a couple of reasons. One is, as I said, you can have better experimental tests of quantum theory, but you could also maybe discover new physical theories that might just be out there. I wouldn't, you know, not bet much money on that, but, but who knows. Although it would be mathematically very interesting, these theories. And you could use them in quantum computation to see what would be their computational power if you had one. And here's one way how you could try to do it. So this is yet another reconstruction. I will not go through the details, but, but there are four other principles that also give you non theory. Um, the interesting thing is they only talk about single systems. You don't talk about composite systems, just single ones that makes things a bit easier. And you have four properties that give you one theory. Classical decomposability, strong symmetry, that there is no third order interference, that's now a postulate here, and something called energy absorption. Now let's play the game and throw away the postulate. So let's throw away the last one. Who cares whether energy is observable or not? Um, whatever it means, you know, maybe you can tell a little later. But when you, when you throw it away, what you find is that you, a larger class of theory satisfies these, these postulates. And these are usually called the, well, class, you have classical probability theory as well. And you have the Jordan algebra state spaces. That's something like quaternionic quantum mechanics, for example. So they suddenly appear here. And now the game to play is obviously, let's drop also the third postulate, there is no further order interference. Now what if we get new theories that show up as new solutions? Well, I claim that they are very interesting. Right? So they would be new, so they would have third order interference in these experiments, but they would still be somehow very close to one theory by satisfying the first two postulates. So it would be really interesting to work out whether these theories here exist, and if so, what they are. But we don't know, it's mathematically very, very difficult. But it's an interesting question. So if, if these exist, they would really be, if you concrete models in these experiments, and you could look at them and do all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, now we, we can do some mathematical science fiction. Uh, we can, we can be, do rigorous speculative calculations. <coughs> Say, suppose we have these theories, let's be speculative and assume they exist. But let's be rigorous and, and really just prove things from these postulates. And then you can, you can for example, compute what entanglement curves would look like. Like, here, yeah, that's, that's the page curve for black hole entropy. Which will, for those of you who know that, it's, it's this curve for like a black hole that starts in a pure state, radiates away. Some of its degrees of freedom and it gets entangled with the outside world, and then this is the entanglement entropy. And then, depending on the degree of interference, you could find different curves, for example. So, you, you can try to make that really predictions from what these theories will tell you what you Okay, so, so that's one, one thing you might want to take from the reconstructions and take them further. Another one is that. They may tell you something about the relation between space time and the structure of quantum theory. So, once you, you've seen these other theories, here's something that you learn. You learn that the structure of quantum theory state space fits very well. It's exceptionally suited to carry space time symmetries, Minkowski space time symmetry. So, for example, we've already seen that there's something like continuous reversibility, quantum states can evolve continuously in time. And that's something we usually expect in, in Minkowski space. Things evolve continuously in time. But the same applies to spatial symmetries. So think of a stern gerlach device and your magnetic field. Now the magnetic field, the direction of it, sets, sets your quantization axis. And by rotating it in all kinds of directions, you can do all cubic measurements. That has to do with the fact that the qubit has a state space, which is just a three-dimensional ball. 
you could not have this behavior with just an arbitrary convex state space. It seems like one theory is just built to fit into these kind of devices. In a way. And you can make that a bit rigorously. Um, and, and here's one, one thought experiment that, that shows you um, that you can sometimes really prove that there's a relation between the two things. So this is work with Andy Gardner and Oscar Dallison, who was here yesterday. And what we show here is that relativity of simultaneity constrains the dimension of the block ball of the quantum field. And the idea is that you have a seen that interferometer like this, and you say, well, I have an upper arm, I have a lower arm, and I go to the regime of physics where I have a single particle that travels either up or down. And these are two possibilities, up or down, so it's like a bit. And that's good, so I can describe it with a block ball. And you say, well, if I know that the particle is definitely in the upper branch, that would be something like the north pole state of your block ball. Definitely the lower branch would be the south pole state. And then there would be states on the equator, which would tell you that if you did a measurement, you would find a 50-50 probability in the arms. Now, um, since everything is linear in this framework, you can actually compute the probability of finding it in the upper arm. It has to do with this, this, this coordinate here in the ball. Z for the probability of finding the upper arm, for example. Maybe you can ask, well, maybe I can have two agents, maybe there's Alice up here and there's Bob down there, and they can do something to it. They can put little pieces of glass inside the arm, or something like this. So what this means is that it's a kind of state transformation that you can do locally. It would do something to the state on the block ball, maybe rotate it somewhere. And we're going to see what, what could this be. What, what could these transformations do to this thing? And it turns out that, that there are not too many possibilities. So, um, I didn't really have this picture enough. Okay, so here's one thing. Um, if you're in Minkowski space, and these are far away from each other, then relativity of simultaneity tells you that it shouldn't matter if TA or, or TB happens first. You don't know is, is that happening first or that, because it can be in different frames of reference. And so the probabilities that you find in the end should be invariant with respect to first doing TA and then TB, or first TB and then TA. And now this gives you a constraint here. And it says, OK, suppose I have such a situation. And suppose, like in quantum theory, that the beam splitter can be tuned to give any probability of finding the particle up here. And I can input things arm so, so that I can actually prepare any state on the ball here. And also, if we have relativity of simultaneity here, then the block ball dimension cannot be arbitrary. It must be either one or two or three or five. And a three-dimensional ball is just a standard qubit, but you could have a classical bit and you could have a, a qubit over the real numbers or a qubit over the quaternions as well. Whereas if you drop the last part, if you don't assume relativity of simultaneity, then D can also be 6, 7, 8, and so on. So somehow you get constraints from the fact that one theory is supposed to fit into space-time conservative theory. Okay, but we know the block ball dimension already. We know it, for example, from the information theoretic postulates. But we have an interesting situation. On the one hand, information theory tells us that the block ball should be three-dimensional. On the other hand, space-time tells us that, yeah, three-dimensional is good and there are not too many other possibilities. So then something interesting is going on here. The, what I think is that this suggests some kind of information theoretic link between the structures of quantum theory and space-time. Yeah. Whatever that means. Um, and I find it surprising that this hasn't been studied more before. There have been some sporadic works by some people um, but, you know, I, this hasn't really been explored, I think, but, it, you know, we, we should probably explore it more. And then learn something that may in the end also help us to make a step towards one another. That's, that's the whole here. You know? So let me just wrap up by, by giving you the, uh, the overview again. So I've shown you a construction, a reconstruction of one here. <coughs> and a suggestion to have continuous reversibility as a kind of glimpse of quantum reality. Then I talked about interpretations and said that um, we think that these reconstructions give us something like a partial interpretation of quantum theory 
and that there is a challenge for, for psionic implications. I talked about other consequences, in particular quantum field and space time. And yeah, so, so if you're interested, here, here are the archive numbers. And yeah, thank you for your attention. System, yet you can still have superpositions that that's this continuous uh, parameterization. Um, so it's almost it almost suggests that not quite. It almost suggests that the quantum state is ontic. That that's yeah. the real thing. Uh, whereas in your second point, you you, you came to a different conclusion. So yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, it's a good point. I think. I would not necessarily interpret this as saying that the quantum state is wanting uh, the, the fact that it can move over continuously from you know, one pure state to the other. Um, it might be a consequence of other things in the world, like the fact that continuous evolution is somehow always enforced in the regime that we're describing. But I don't think it forces you into particular expectation. I would, I would feel that. You know, it's still, the other postulates are still information theoretic. So, um, if we want to draw a lesson, then I would still draw the lesson that an informational view on the quantum state is somehow suggested by it. So, but it's debatable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make a very strong statement on this point. I, I thought your postulate 3 was quite interesting because it it uh, looks like a kind of generalized version of the church Turing principle or something like that, saying that every physical system can be simulated on the computer. Can you comment on that? Mm. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, I've been asked that before. I think it's true to some extent. Um, I guess if, if you want to have computability in, the, in a sense of having something like a quantum computer, Classically, a classical computer, we can say the processes that we tend to find in nature can be simulated to <coughs> as an principle on such a machine. And I don't think this is a necessary condition for it. Um, it doesn't postulate, for example, that you can approximate everything by a discrete gate set or something like that. So if you really want to build a computer, you need other things. So it's a bit less than that, but it's kind of the spirit. Everything's built from bits and also every. So if it were true, it wouldn't necessarily imply something like the church characteristic. Yes. Um, you could have well, let me think. Um, well I guess because you talk about states. So just because you can encode a state in a physical system in a bunch of bits doesn't mean it simulate. Uh, you can simulate the transformations as well, so that's that's part of the postulate. So, um, but it doesn't really talk about computability in the sense that you have a finite set of primitive operations. Right. It's more, um, yeah, it doesn't it's imply. It's a bit less. Than, it doesn't imply a universal unity. Not directly. the challenge for the many worlds prism, right? Because you said, look, you can see a kind of analog of taking some sort of fundamental many worlds you type postulate and seeing how to constrain it down to give you quantum mechanics. But those postulates that those information theoretic postulates you've introduced give you essentially the kinematic structure, the Hilbert space structure yeah. of quantum mechanics. You're not getting other dynamical structure. Right. So it seems to me it should be neutral as to what interpretation you're... Mm -hmm. I mean, many worlds is just the usual Hilbert space structure plus unitarity. Yes. 
And unitarity seems to be consistent with your postulates. Yes. So why can't the why can't the, um, the stubborn many worlds person say, um, I'm going to take all your your within a, a many worlds ontology. I'm going to take your postulates. I'm going to show why it is that we have a hilton space. Um, so, yeah, I mean, can you repeat your last sentence again, sorry? I mean, given that the postulates are neutral as to the dynamics, yes. and many worlds are really defined by dynamics, um, I don't see why that the, the, um, the, the challenge that you're posing can't be met for the many worlds. Maybe it can be met. Maybe it can be met. I mean, you could... It's conceivable that you can come up with something like that, right? You can say, let me think of a very broad idea of, of, of a world that exists in many versions at the same time, whatever that means, but maybe I can make a mathematical description, which is broader than the quantum framework. And then you say, well, but on top of that, I, I know that this behaves in some kind of nice way, which allows me to, to do meaningful physics inside there. Maybe you can then actually get the same kinematics kinematical structure too. It's conceivable. And it would be super interesting, it would be dark. I would find it really interesting. Um, so I don't think it's so much about dynamics versus kinematics because you have just have the same kinematics also in that interpretation. Um, so I mean as you kind of emphasize this it is the quantum information has different properties from, from classical information. This continuous reversibility, it's a, it's a property of the information somehow. And this is kind of the message I got. And at the same time, this, I, I find very strongly suggestive of some kind of ontology. That information has properties. In our world, the information has certain properties, the way it's represented, the way it's, and it is suggests to me somehow kind of <laughs> almost haunting feeling of what is stated. And, Maybe. I mean, another way, you, well, what I would like to do at this point is not say, well, I take a very strong view on the world as a consequence of that. And we could say, well, there are regimes in physics where we expect that continuous time just doesn't work anymore. Like we want gravity, for example. So the fact that it seems to be a characteristic property of quantum theory, strong enough to give you a formalism, might just make you speculate that in that other regime, Maybe quantum theory is modified in some way. Because that principle cannot be satisfied anymore in the way we usually understand it. So so that would be a kind of speculation that I I think might be might be fruitful to take from that maybe. Do you say information is some some kind of stuff? Is this how you understand information? Here? Because you were talking about stuff, you were talking about information, and you say how information is different, it has different properties from classical information? The way we know how to represent um, classical information. No, I think I think you you have many options how to integrate that, and it's not clear from that how you should. You know, classical probabilities you can integrate in many different ways, and that you can interpret in at, at least as many different ways. I would say. Um, and of course, I'm using all kinds of words when I describe these setups. I say, oh, here's a preparation, and a guy presses the button. It doesn't have to be. It could be. A, distant star that emits something that I just happened to, to like, detect in my, my telescope. So some of it is also just a way to describe it in a nice way. That doesn't mean that it must be understood that way. Uh, so do you see infinite nationality coming to the picture of the at some point? Do you see it nicely because Usually, um, in standard physics, when we deal with relativity, it's uh, with an infinite dimensional system. Mm -hmm. But uh, these reconstructions are usually for finite dimensional systems. Yes. So, um, that's right. So, in a way, it's a drawback that we only get finite dimensional quantum theory. But I wouldn't see it as a very strong drawback. Because if you ask it, how could physics be different than most of the signatures you see in finite dimensions already? You say, what are the possible correlations in a Bell experiment? Then, up to, up to a technical conjecture, you basically, in finite dimensions, get already all the behaviors that you also get in infinite dimensions. I think 
um, the difference between a quantum state and a PR box is just vastly bigger than, say, a finite dimensional quantum system from an infinite dimensional quantum system. I think it's more a mathematical question how you generalize from finite to infinite dimensions. Physical questions come in and we ask, what's the Hamiltonian that I put on top of the Where Symmetry. Also, what are the symmetries of space time? These are the physical questions. And they are completely, they are not there at all here. But just abstractly, if you have abstract finite or abstract infinite dimensional quantum theory, I don't think that's very much the difference. Also, there are some essential parts of quantum theory, for example, um, in statistics. Mm -hmm. These are usually derived when you have uh, Lorentz symmetries. Yes. But it's not in this picture. No, and that's good because people do use one theory in other space times that they make up and say, oh, if I had two dimensions, I could have any answer, for example. And then they say, yeah, maybe I can realize it in the lab somehow and so on. So it's actually good in that sense that we don't get it. And it's good that we can start from some principles mm -hmm. and then derive some statistics, for example. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But um, yes. do you see any like difficulty that there are some fundamental results of quantum theory? You have to use infinite dimensions to derive. If you don't use them, you can never derive them using mm -hmm. in this, in this uh, framework. I don't know. I would, I would guess what, as you said, this would be within one field theory, for example. Now, where does one field theory come from? It comes from taking one theory and putting some of Lorentz symmetry on it, or Minkowski space time. This basically gives you already very big constraints that tell you how you would do a quantum field theory, and then you need infinite dimensions and so on. So that's actually part of the reason why I would like to go in that direction and explore how the probabilistic structure of quantum theory fits together in space time and see what we find there. Because maybe we find more there and it will allow us to, to answer more questions later. Um, or even how So again, I mean, I'm pretty much agnostic, and I, I have to say that nothing follows logically from it. It doesn't force you into a particular interpretation. It's more the following. So I guess it's really the case when you learn quantum theory and you just learn the textbook postulates that, that leaves you somewhat puzzled. You, you would want to ask why is it that way and not another way? Why should I use all these unitaries and operators and so on? And I would say the fact that you can get this from more easily describable, maybe simpler principles is already a way forward. It tells you something. You learn something. Now, how are these possibilities formulated? Well, the language in which they are phrased is, is on the face of it, very information theoretic. It's about probabilities, about encoding, and so on. So you might just see this as evidence that there is something to it about the quantum state which has to do with this we are of the world, we have knowledge or information to believe. One theory is about that in some sense. It's not a proof of that, but it is kind of evidence. But if tomorrow somebody comes and does the same thing from a many worlds point of view, they would say, okay, uh, it's like in a soccer match, we have one goal first, and now it's one to one. <laughs> you know? It's just, I think, something that, that you can do right now, which, which you can naturally do from an information theory point of view, but not so much from the standpoint of one of these psychotic
asked somebody who wasn't familiar with this research, a quantum information scientist, um, write down some sort of properties of quantum states that means that they're representatives of information. They definitely wouldn't write down your four axioms, they might write down a whole lot of other things that might, might, might not be related to your axioms. Furthermore, some of your axioms, so the axiom that says you can map any pure state to any other pure state, which sounds obviously about information, in a very strong, clear sense, it doesn't seem a fair statement. If you don't have any idea what information really is, in any sort of precise way that we could extract from that sentence, the very idea of quantitative representation, information, anything like your four axioms, then you sort of come up with one. So, um, so first of all, I agree with what you said that this continuous traversability is not very information theoretic. Actually, I said this specifically, and uh, that's why I said maybe this is something we learn which is not information theoretic. Now, yeah, obviously, if you ask somebody, make up some theory of information, please write down some principles for such a thing. They would probably not write down these four postulates. So it's not but, true then. Very idea of quantum states merely is being represented as information is enough to explain that. Well, so see, look, you, you could do the same, you could say, well, um, I, I've learned at some point that, um, that we can understand the Lorentz transformations in a geometric way. In a way, they arise just from the fact that space time has a geometric structure. But if you ask somebody to just write down some theory of geometry, they wouldn't necessarily write down special relativity for you. That's what people didn't do in the century before. They worked on other theories. So, I mean, it's still remarkable that you can get the Lorentz transformations from a geometric point of view and we can learn something from it. And I just think that the same happens here. Um, we can understand the Hilbert space formalism from constraints that are phrased in a terminology which is information theoretic. What does information mean? Nobody knows and we don't have to know to work with these postulates. I can describe what I mean by these postulates when you go to the lab and do something. Uh, like local tomography, I told you what that means concretely. So we don't need to understand what information is fundamentally. Right. But maybe we, but still, it's I, very suggestive. I, I, I agree with that more qualified statement. I think this statement taken at face value is, is a lot stronger. It's not. Mm. You replace power with potential. <clears throat> yeah. Um, maybe. I would just say what you just said instead. Just quote yourself. <laughs> well, I think just to put the thing into sort of, again, a kind of historical perspective, the example you use of Minkowski space time, Einstein would not say that's a principle theory. That's fine, principle but theory. we would probably, some of us would. Fine, but then, but then the dis distinction between principle constructive theory becomes very, very vague. I mean, for Einstein, the principle theory is a phenomenological theory, in principle. Minkowski is based on not phenomenological. And in fact, Einstein's own final version of special relativity he moved away from the principle theory approach and just talked about Lorentz covariance, the fundamental principle of all the non-gravitational interactions. That's not a principle of paper, a principle of consensus either. I mean, all theories rely on principles. Yeah. The question is, if you're going to make it, if we're going to use Einstein's distinction of principle in the constructive theory, the, the term principle really should be restricted to phenomenological principles, like thermodynamics. As you mentioned, that was his template. But the minute you bring in things like Minkowski space-time, I mean, you're saying, if I say that space-time is Minkowski, I can explain a whole lot of things. Well, why Minkowski space-time? I mean, why, for example, is it that in people working on reconstructions of quantum mechanics don't apply the same thing to the general relativity. I mean, when I pick up a textbook on general relativity, I have to learn all this stuff about differentiable manifolds and tensors and affine connections. Why is it that I'm not looking for information theoretic principles that will explain all that stuff to me? Well, the operation principles, right? So when, I, when you open a book on GR, I mean, you're more an expert on, on that topic, but, but one thing that struck me when I was a student is that you can say, hey, what, what if I'm a physicist and I'm falling in an elevator? Can I make a distinction operationally between the free-floating gravitational field or just falling? Um, 
So, so, and but this gives you... Yeah, but to go from that to the field equation is an enormous jump. Well, it gives you at least, um, it gets you to the point where you say, well, then I need differential geometry to model what's going on. That is already a pretty big step. So, so in some sense, this is also happening there. Um, so does that make GR a principle theory? I don't think so. But I don't think the yeah. terms principle theory and the, and the constructive theory are really mathematically strictly well-defined. Um, by the way, so for example, with the Bohmian mechanics, would that be a constructive theory? Yeah. You, you would say so. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, but then this is more a principle theory here. And yeah. so if you compare the two and say, if I, if I have these two drawers I want to open, then I would still put that into the principle theory yeah. drawer. And as I understand it, but that's probably debatable, even um, special relativity would, be, would for me be more in principle and like draw of theories. Sure, but the, the 1905 version. Okay. But not the Minkowski space version. Mm. Yeah, maybe. Um, okay, we should talk about this. How do your principles help us go beyond quantum theory and theories that might take us towards quantum gravity? Okay, so, so you, can, you can ask two things. You can say, well, what what do I do if I want to go to quantum gravity? And second, you can ask, what if I just want nice alternatives that I can test in experiments? For the second question, I tried to give an answer in the last part. So there are actually now these things that, that you can describe mathematically. And they would be nice alternatives to one theory. They would have thought out interference. This would be alternatives to one theory. That, that you get by dropping postulates for one theory. So that would be the... Yeah, but hang on. If you're going to take some postulates that you need to have a quantum theory and then drop some postulates because we think we're going towards quantum gravity, that only really makes sense if, if amongst all your postulates, yeah. s -s some you know, look very reasonable even in the face of quantum gravity. Yes. Look a lot less reasonable. Yes. There's no particular reason to say that, you know, general relativity questions are, are, are ruling out a third order interference, yes. right? Well, and that's all the thing. So why are you dropping three or four and not one or two? That I don't really see. So, so doing this doesn't bring us closer to quantum gravity, this particular thing. I said, let's talk about two things first, how to go to quantum okay, gravity, and yeah. then second, how to build these other experiments. This would be for the second part. You would get theories that do have thought out interference. So this would be about those experiments that people are doing at the moment in the lab. Now what about quantum gravity? Well, obviously it's not easy to build a theory of quantum gravity. And you would not just do it by writing on another GPT. You would have maybe want a framework where you have indefinite causal structure from the start. Where your framework allows, allows for more than just preparation transformation measurement. That's what Lucien is doing, for example. Or you would say, hey, maybe I can just at least learn a couple of interesting things here, namely, ah, continuous time evolution. That's here very characteristic of quantum theory. Focus on the second part. Um, so this thing. You say, well, if I believe that there's a regime of the world where this is not applying anymore as before, then the, you can see this is a hint that maybe you, you want to give up that part. So, but I don't know how to do quantum gravity, obviously. So if you drop your axiom, don't automatically out of your methods get some sort of counterfoil. No, no, in this sense, no. Like these four, four postulates, if you just replace continuous by discrete here, you get classical probability theory in, in this specific axiomatization. And if you just say reversible, you get the classical and quantum, or? Uh, yeah, I think so. So it's not easy, it's not just, you know, you, have, you now have a maximization quantum theory, now you twist it a little bit and out pops quantum gravity. I think that's nothing we should expect from any of this. You would have to work more, you would change the framework in the first place. Right. So the opposite, I think you should be ambitious and try, really try to do that. Yes, but not in that way, not by playing with this framework and these axioms and relaxing on that. Why not? Because you need to change the framework. Why? Why? Because in the assumptions of the framework, it's built in that you have preparation followed by a transformation followed as a measurement, for example, sometimes at least. But you might want to have something like indefinite causal structure. I think Lucien makes a good point that we need this generalization. And then we end up with something like process matrices or the causal Lloyd framework. And I think these are more steps into the direction of quantum gravity.
many uh, different constructions are there on the market? Uh, enough. Uh, <laughs> do, you see, do you see that as a good thing or, or a bad thing? I see it as a good thing because if you like, put them on a table now, you can kind of see the main aspects defined in all of them. So, for example, something like continuous reversibility is in all of them, just in kind of different language. Purification that Julio likes to talk about, that always gives you that kind of thing as well. And so, I think we've gained a quite good understanding of what you need from in this framework to get more theory. Do you think in the future there might be one or a few that stand out as better ones? I don't think so, honestly. I was wondering if this is a very naive question. When you see these postulates, at least at the first sight, it seems like some of them are constraining, whereas the others allowing certain things. Is there anything like that really going on, or is it just a way of how you view it? Like, uh, like no simultaneous encoding, so this is a constraint. But continuous reversibility, is it a constraint, or is it uh, something that's allowed? Yeah, I think the first three allow you to do things, the fourth, fourth constraints. Yeah. Yeah. Or I mean the second because here is a constraint because it's how you, you just have the local choice of freedom and the correlations and you cannot have more than that. So in that language it would be a constraint, but the theory can be here for 